So our next topic is, uh, I came up with this one on my own, with some help, but making lemonade out of lemons, fire use concepts. So when a fire starts, how can you use it to your advantage? Is it possible to turn it back into a prescribed fire and work with it in a positive manner? So our next speaker is Mr. Randy Russell. Randy was raised on a farm. In rural central Iowa, he obtained a BS from Iowa State University in forest management with a minor in range and soils in 1976. Randy attended Arizona State University towards a master's in range management in 78. He retired in 2011 from the USDA Forest Service after, after an impressive 37-year career in range management. With the, for, with the USDA Forest Service, he was active in wildfire suppression, prescribed burning and rehab with division supervisor, and prescribed burn boss qualifications. Wildfire suppression assignments took Randy to New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, California, and in a variety of fuel types and burning conditions. Mr. Russell is currently an active division supervisor on a Type 3 team in North Idaho and has been since 2011. He has also participated in seven prescribed burns in West Texas during 2015. Most importantly, he's also my dad. So please give him a round of applause and welcome him to our burn school. Okay. Uh, just a note of probably another family thing, that just happens to be Morgan's brother, my son on the cover page. I just discovered that this morning. And I think that picture was, I don't know, two years ago. Uh, looks like on the North Kaibab in Arizona. So it kind of runs in the family. Uh, anyway, I'm kind of proud of that fact too. Uh, and I'm glad Morgan addressed the title because well, I'd probably have preferred something like making beer from hops or something along that line. But anyway, that's the title, but the words are my own, so here we go. Okay, uh, to start off with, I'm very glad that uh, each one of you are here and most of you stayed for their whole duration. That says something for your interest in, in fire and fire management and its implications. Uh, it says that you're here to learn, and I don't know if I can teach anything, and what I say is not gospel. But if I can share some of my experiences with you, uh, you can take home with uh, what I learned from sharing my experiences with you. Uh, questions anytime are welcome. Just raise your hand and we'll answer questions anytime. You don't have to wait to the end. Uh, I'll probably be discussing wildfire suppression, prescribed natural fire, and ignited prescribed fire. Uh, Wildfires are either human caused or lightning. Prescribed natural fire is when Mother Nature starts a fire, but it's within a defined area and we allow it to burn because we've got some predetermined factors already. And then of course, ignited prescribed fire is, is a lot what uh, we heard this talk on earlier this afternoon with, with Mr. Treadwell. I was really impressed with all the speakers today. They are all, geez, right on the money as far as what I've experienced, what I've learned, and, and you know, what I've seen happen. Uh, I'm glad to hear Mr. Lander speak also, and I can say I'm just glad you're all here, and I hope you take something home with you from this. Uh, the topics that I kind of broke them out in, I guess, four or five areas, diversity, safety, weeds, grazing strategy, rehab, recovery, and adaptive management. Because like the Foster family said, that uh, most of the time they don't go as you had planned or as you had dreamed or envisioned, but just accept with whatever you got and build on it in successive following years. Um, I've seen quite a few prescribed fires. Like I said, I was a prescribed burn manager for a number of years. Kind of the old joke we told behind the lines, we didn't put it on the front page of the newspaper, but it was about the only successful prescribed fires when they just make you pucker up so tight, tighter than a bull's ass in uh, fly season. Um, so you just got to accept what you get. Diversity is quite a topic these days. It's, it's not related to gender or uh, 
minorities, whatever. It's a diversity in skills. Knowledge is the first one. We all have a valued abilities in various areas and expertise. Um, gosh, that ranges anywhere from, you know, whether you can rope a calf or you can be a rodeo queen or uh, run a computer or put fire out. Uh, the computer skills are very important these days. Uh, pay attention to people that are particularly able to use fire modeling, fire behavior, fire progression modules, smoke as what I think Grant spoke with, uh, spoke to this morning. There's a lot of models and, and expertise to be gleaned from these individuals. Uh, fire suppression. Uh, the, the Treadwell talk, you know, spoke a lot to prescribe fire, but like he said, he also gets involved in wildfire suppression. Drones is another big thing that the world is coming to these days. It's kind of like a flying paper plate. I don't know what you call it. Morgan is going to have, I think, two of them tomorrow on scene. Um, and they're going to be detecting, detecting such things as, I guess, temperature and fire intensity. As, long, as well as our, our film crew guy here in the back. So drones, we actually, uh, two years ago was the first time that I'd seen a drone used in a wildfire suppression in North Idaho up by Ponderay Lake. Uh, the drone was cheap, $700 a day, and it come with a pilot, which is a guy with a, looks like a computer toy. And he would be able to fly up to four or five miles away, sent video back, we were able to recon where the roads were, the logging roads, uh, the lakes. We were determined where the smoke was, where the active fire line, uh, active fire was, and where it had already burnt. That was quite interesting to me. And this year, uh, they've got approval in North Idaho for I think we've got two approved pilots, and they actually are with the National Forest Service up in that neck of the woods. Um, well, I guess I should explain too. I retired from the USDA Forest Service out of Southern Utah. I migrated up north to Montana and North Idaho, so that's where I've kind of been keeping my fire qualifications. Asking, does anybody know what a division supervisor is? You know, one guy does. Uh, Grant, no, not Grant, the previous speaker, Shank, Mo, Mo, Chris, referred to the ICS. When you get multiple agencies on scene in a wildfire or possibly prescribed fire, communication is very important. And the incident command system was developed probably about 25 years ago. They, are, they were developed for multiple varying different agencies to converge on an emergency like a hurricane, tornado, wildfire, or in this case prescribed, prescribed fires like here in West Texas. And what it is, it's a unified command system where everybody's basically on the same radio frequencies and it's got a clearly defined chain of command with an incident commander and then various branches that work underneath of him. And it's, it seems to be working very well. And I don't know if Texas Forest Service is using that model or not. Morgan shaking her head yes. But communication is very important. Um, that was kind of leading me more into this uh, third item here, fire savvy. There's a big diversity in skills, and, and some guys are good at working a shovel. Some are good at flapping a gunny sack. Um, some of them are good at driving a pickup to deliver supplies out to the fire line. Some of them are good at delivering, making up drip torch mixes. You know, the drip torches that we use to ignite fire, it's two-thirds diesel, one-third gas. So there's a variety of skills as far as fire savvy. I have direct attack or indirect attack. Direct attack in a wildfire situation is where you're actually on the fire line itself and you're going direct with no one burnt fuel really between you and the flame. And that direct attack can either be with uh, ground crews or fire engines or an aerial attack that goes direct on the fire. An indirect attack is where you've backed off a canyon, a ridge, a gully, and you've got some unburnt country between you and the fire, so you're going indirect and going to let the fire burn up to your, your line. So fire savvy, there's a lot of different techniques and, and people that are good at what they do in either one of those cases. 
uh, equipment, you know that, boy, there's drone operators, there's dozer operators, engine, uh, like the volunteer guys, their expertise is going to be running that fire engine or pumper truck, as we used to call them, and putting a hose layout. Take advantage of their expertise. It's if you're get, taking advantage of them beforehand when you're just talking in the station about what you can do or if you're out there on the line making those assignments make sure that when you're sending somebody on assignment that's in an area of their expertise so that you send a guy to run a fire truck he knows how to start the pump check the gas get the pressure up know whether he's pumping uphill or downhill so he doesn't blow the line uh, try to take that all into consideration local knowledge is something that uh, you can ensure involve the, the local fire departments as well as the local landowner, the ranchers. And I'm glad to see so many producers here today because that's where it's going to start. Um, the local knowledge is invaluable whether it comes to terrain. Um, well, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. I should address LEMS first. LEM, L-E-M, is a term that was developed back in the oh, 30s uh, CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps days. That's when there were so many unemployed and the, and the city folks were took work uh, basically out west to build roads, bridges, um, trails, buildings, lookout towers, fences. They built miles of fence, the Civil Conservation Corps did. And on that Civilian Conservation Corps they had LEMS and a LEM was a local experience man. They call him Lems for short. That was who everybody went to. He was a go-to guy to just learn how to mix mortar to lay brick for foundations or footings on bridges or you know he was a pretty good powder monkey or he knew how to lay out a trail or a road. So Lems are very important and I just kind of carried that forward. It's not a derogative term so if you call somebody a Lem it's not short for lemon. But these local guys know where water locations are, they know what, where the livestock are, they know what pasture they're in, they know where the people are at, they know where the structures are. It might have been the old wood structure that the Fosters say, they know where the, the ranch headquarters are at, they know where the fences are. And most importantly, they know where the damn gates are. So many times, you know, you bring a dozer in, track hole, fire truck, whatever, man, the fire's going, the first thing they do is get the wire cutters out and cut the fence. You know, a lot of times there'll be a gate that literally, and I've experienced this, not less than a quarter mile, sometimes a hundred yards from where, from where they cut the fence. The old fire stars are excellent places to tie in to burn or to base a prescribed fire off of. The old fire stars have been burnt and so the fuels, the fuels have been reduced there. It's not as heavy fuel loading and it's just a good anchor point or some place to burn into. Cooperation. Um, wow, this is this is a real interesting one. Oop. I wonder if I can go back here. Now. Can I go backwards? Okay. But cooperation. It's very important that you cooperate. Uh, respect all opinions. And that kind of gets back to the chain of command. You may not agree with him but you've got to respect his opinion. Um, as a division soup, division soups in the ICS system are in charge of a section of fire line. And it can be anywhere from a mile up to 12 miles. And that division soup is responsible for basically the air operations, uh, air tankers, uh, all the rotor work, helicopters that are online, dozers, engines, and the crews. Uh, you can have, you know, there, you can get into several hundred people working for you. I like to solicit ideas from most of the people that have been on the fire or just came on the fire new to get a fresh set of eyes. A good, a second opinion is always good and uh, I, I search it out. I seek that second opinion. Lo no egos are needed. Um, egotism, uh, Guys that want to be big, big, people that want to be big shots, want to be heard, uh, think their way is the only way. There's no need for that. We're all on the same team, working together toward the same end. Um, it's just uh, 
It creates a conflict. It doesn't build crew cohesion. Uh, and, it, and it detracts from your mission statement of putting the fire out or getting the prescribed fire going. Um, but I've been involved with that so many times and uh, I've been lucky at it. It's kind of like the old Packer said one time. He said, I'll take luck any time over being good. The local, well, this gets along with uh, cooperation, especially with the local volunteers, the other agency people, and the private landowners, and law enforcement. It just works a whole lot better if you can coordinate them and talk to them. Face-to-face -face works a lot better than it does on the radio. A lot of times you don't have the opportunity to chase them down and meet in person. So maintain that communication by radio if possible or cell phone. And uh, I guess I kind of summed it up by solicit all ideas as time permits. Sometime when it's going and blowing, you don't really have time to, to get around and play patty cake with everybody. You've got to make the best decisions as you see fit at the time. Uh, but it sure doesn't hurt to use them if you've got the time. And the last one is planning. Um, gosh, how, how, long, how many times have you heard the word planning today? I guess we can't stress it enough. I think all the speakers have talked about planning. Um, plan for wildfire potential to use it to your advantage. As we're sitting here today, I hope what's going through your mind is you're thinking, what can I use back home? You know, I know we've all got a picture of what we've heard and thinking, boy, maybe I could use that over on the north side or, or down by the windmill or... Uh, there was that place that burned last year. It was a lightning strike and it laid in a tree for two days and it come up. Kind of have those things in your mind. Plan for wildfire potential to use it to your advantage. Maybe if you can put some fire line. Well, and I gotta use the right word. Fire guard. Put a fire guard in ahead of time so you can use it later. Like the foster said, Treadwell spoke to it. Uh, put those lines in once they're in, they're gonna stay for a few years. So kind of put them in place, not only to manage your prescribed fire, but possibly use it to manage your uh, wildfire. Um, and then lastly, respect. Uh, respect all opinions. Uh, then your, your fellow co-workers and the people you have working for you. That'll go a long way to work. Oh, now I just looked at the picture. Actually, most of these pictures are all mine. I didn't rob them off the internet. Um, well, there was some case, I guess, my son or daughter took them. This was in Idaho two years ago. That was a, an Alaskan native. They shipped, gosh dang, I don't know how many Greyhound buses full of Anuits, Anuits, Anuits guys down. They come from sea level, North Alaska, down to 6,000 foot elevation where it was 90 degrees. And there were, uh, most of them were overweight. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Gee whiz, they're really some good people. They brought down some uh, chewing tobacco that they make out of willow trees. And they wanted me to try some. And I said no for two days. But on the third day, I said, all right, I'll try it. And you never need to try that stuff. It's uh, pretty cold stuff. I don't know what they put in it. But they got it on board the plane. They brought it down. Um, and then, it, well, there was a lot of stories I could tell. We had one girl go down, I thought it was heat exhaustion. She was down in the canyon. They'd been here two, only two shifts. So, of course, you know, we, like, we went over, we got her up, got her, the, had the pickup running, it was air conditioned, we got her in there, and of course, we evac'd her back to camp. And they took her into town, and, and uh, I was hoping she would recover, and when I got back into camp that night, um, we asked how the, the crew member was doing. And uh, she was pregnant, <laughs> and nobody knew it. So anyway, I guess that was my congratulations go out to her. I never did hear how the pregnancy turned out, but uh, anyway, she stuck around. So just respect everyone you're working with, no matter what their, I guess, uh, their, their personal beliefs are, because you can learn something from all of them. Safety, Mr. Trevor held me talk a little bit about safety. Uh, yeah, I don't know about all, I guess I spoke about nylon underwear, but you really don't want to be in a, in a burning situation with nylon because it doesn't burn, it just sticks to your skin. And when you go to a burn rehab center, it's real ugly to clear up and clean up and, and, and to recover from. 
It's kind of a little thing, dumb thing, but uh, we've already spoke a lot about communication, verbal, on the radio and on cell phones. Uh, get everybody on the same, same frequency. Um, I guess as far as safety goes, I've had a lot of guys have went down with heat exhaustion. Um, man, and that's just an evacuation situation. You know, sometimes it involves a, a, a short line, you know, helicopter, uh, life flight stuff. You, you just don't want to experience that. Most of that responsibility falls on the division suit to coordinate that incident within an incident. Um, single engine air tanker is nothing more than a crop duster that's set up to drop fire retardant or water. Um, I was witness to a seat going down about 10 years ago and uh, it's unfortunate um, but it was an accident and probably in that case it was, wasn't preventable. Um, pickups burned over, the one that I can remember most vividly was Probably could have been prevented. Um, this would have been in northern Arizona, north of the Grand Canyon, towards the Nevada side. Had a crew, had a 20-man crew off the Fish Lake National Forest in Utah. They came to the briefing, first shift on the fire. They had a four-door pickup, and it was a rough, rocky road, you know, probably about five, six miles from fire camp, which was in an isolated location. And they were kids, um, and I speak of kids these days, and, and uh, I, I take great responsibility in my job as division suit, because most of these are kids. They're 30 years old or less. They're like Morgan and my son Jake and, and, and your kids and grandkids. So anyway, these college kids out trying to earn a buck for the summer, they taken this pickup down in, and we had some active fire. We were getting a line around it. It was an arid environment, uh, upper Mojave Desert Zone. Um, we had a thunderstorm, cold front come through, the wind shifted 180 degrees, we got warning of it, I gave the word to disengage, we're getting everybody out. And uh, of course, I'm, as a division chief, you're usually the last one off the line because you're counting the chicks as they head out. Well, the Fish Lake crew got back to their pickup and they were heading back up the road and, and the kid that was driving it, when the wind shifted 180 degrees, the fire that was up in that country had come back down and was burning an unburnt country and it's through smoke across the two-track road, believe it or not. The smoke management wasn't very good on that one and he, he lost track of where the two-track road was and going uphill, rocky, he spun out. Well, so naturally what everybody does, we back up, back down the road, going to get another run at it. Well, it was smoky and in backing up, he backed off the road. He got out of the tracks, got the rocks, hung up and he did not have four-wheel drive. The four-wheel drive did not work in the pickup, and they brought it into the fire that way. Nobody knew, or I didn't know it, I guess they did. They were too embarrassed to say they brought a pickup with four-wheel drive that didn't work. So their, the vehicle was stuck, and the fire was literally right on top of them. So it was a four-door, and I don't know what, forgetting out there's four, five, six people in it. They bailed out, got into the black, which is a safe zone. It's like, uh, the black areas we describe as safety zones. If you get in a jam, get in the black. So they retreated to the black and the fire consumed the pickup. And I heard on the radio, particular airways, get everybody out. Of course, I was really feeling, I was really hustling then to get up to where they were. And when I got there, the pickup was totally engulfed. Uh, we had lost six steel chainsaws, I think there were six sixes. Um, there were six fire packs in the back and you know, two or three five gallon cans of fuel. And um, at least a lot of paperwork too, but I was just glad we didn't have any other losses other than that. It was kind of embarrassing to them folks. And, but that's stuff you do want to avoid. Equipment loss, fire tools. I don't know how many times I've come across you've seen Pulaski's or shovels land that have been used uh, retard drop on horses. Um, Chris Shank spoke to the 1988 Yellowstone fires and that was an important turning point in kind of prescribed fire. The National Park Service was implementing a, I think they called it let burn at that time. In other words, if they got a lightning strike, they were going to let it burn, let Mother Nature take its course. So then you had the National Forest Service surrounding the park and they were uh, Kind of smoky the bear mentality, you get a smoke, you get a fire, you put it out. So they had the conflicting policy uh, interpretations. And 
Well, golly, that 1988 all of, Nash, all of Yellowstone National Park was on fire, and then it escaped from the park out onto the national forest. It was a very politically sensitive topic. Uh, agencies weren't liking each other. But during that time, I was up there for 31 days straight, and that was back when you were on wildfire assignment. There wasn't the 21-day stay limit, and now it's recently you stay 14 days on a fire before you return home for R&R. &R. So I, I had kind of teamed up with some packers and we'd been packing in to, to a, a spike camp. It's about, it was only about three miles back in in the park. And of course, Buzzy and, and Bill Hoppy, who was a pack string owner out of Gardner, Montana, they were just in awe at all the air show going on. Of course, we left at daylight, got into camp, and it was getting to be 11 o'clock. Buzzy and Bill were watching the helicopters and the air tankers and the hot shot crews and all the yellow tents and the nice kitchen that was set up. And I kept saying, Bill, we gotta get out of here. It's heating up. And it's getting along towards 11 o'clock on the fire, 10 o'clock, the humidities are dropping and you need to be heads up because that's when the fire activity picks up no matter what type of situation you're in. Well, it heated up, so we uh, strung the mules together and got out. We were heading back down, and, and I had a radio, and of course, air attack called for an air tank or a retardant drop right pretty much in the country we were going to be heading through on the trail back down. And old Bill, he rode off in the smoke, and he come back and said, we can't get through. I said, well, we got to tie up because there's an air attack. They just called for a retardant drop, and it's going to be right here where we are. So we tied up the string. And, got back on some logs, we got away from a ways, and that dead gum retardant drop come right on top of us. It dropped on the saddles, on the mules, on the horses, slippery. It's the consistency of jello before it sets up. And it's a mixture of clay, ammonia, and water. It, it almost burns your nose. But anyway, that slimy damn shit was just everywhere. Bill and Buzzy could never, never see nothing like it. They were just, what in the heck is all this stuff? So we probably could have been a little more smart, smart by getting out of there, you know, two hours sooner. Um, but I was trying to be nice and let them watch the show. And, you know, like I said, that was 1988, and I'm a little bit smarter now. Well, I hope I am. And uh, fire shelter deployment. Uh, I don't think fire shelters are required down here in Texas. All federal firefighters are required to cover. Uh, basically, it's a, a small pup tent that's made out of something similar to Reynolds Wrap. You've heard different slang terms, they're called shake and bake and I don't know, whatever, but all firefighters are required to carry them on, on uh, federal firefighters are, and in case of an uh, escape fire, an explosive situation where you're unable to follow your escape route back to your safety zone, you deploy your fire shelter. TFS requires it. Beg your pardon? Uh, TFS requires them, and if your department's part of T uh, TIFMAS, you're required to carry them also. Good. Did everybody hear that? Uh, volunteer fire departments in Texas are required? Well, no. If your fire department is part of the Texas Inter Interstate Fire Mutual Aid System that goes with Texas Forest Service, you're required to have a fire shelter within reach once you get out of the truck. Either okay. On you or within reach. So there is some awareness. And I don't know if some of the ranchers or uh, students that are here, I know there's one 15-year-old boy here. There he is over there, so we've got a variety of ages here today also. I'm very glad to have you here too. Um, and I can answer questions about fire shelters and, and uh, deployment later. Uh, vegetation. Um, this picture actually happens, this was, uh, I don't this was, down here in West Angelo somewhere, maybe down Fredericksburg Way, that uh, I helped out on a couple years ago. So actually I do have some experience in Texas. Not much, but a little. Um, planning for a prescribed burn in also anticipation of maybe shortcutting or preventing a wildfire, you gotta understand your vegetation. And this kind of gets along with the fuel loading is. But the fuel types are very important. We've got a lot of pear, mesquite, cedar, grass, open grasslands down here in this Edwards Plateau country. And then you get up north of here and it's more what I call a open grassland, is that correct? So you need to be aware of, of uh, fire activity and, and how it burns, because it does burn different. 
Something else to be aware of that uh, a little bit ahead of time so you can make that lemonade is uh, weeds. Um, know what your invasive weeds are. Know what your noxious weeds are, what the noxious weed list is. Know what your native grasses and your non-native grasses are. Um, you know, there, there is professional help around to help you identify them if you don't know where they are. When you get to the point where you're making maps and outlining burn unit areas and contingency lines, it's good to know where these, these weed sites are. You can even label them on your map so fire trucks and dozer, track holes, whatever, don't go through these noxious weed areas and, and spread them for you. Um, herbicide, grazing, or fire. These are all a combination of tools that you can use. Um, herbicides rather expensive. Uh, yeah, it's forty, fifty dollars an acre. Mechanical treatments, hundred dollars an acre. Um, hot water. I had that on there. Morgan asked me, "What is that?" And there's a, you can actually set up a water, a heated water system, boiler system, and hot water will actually kind of melt the leaf, the the waxy surface of the leaf, the cuticle off a plant, and will um, sometimes work in certain applications on depending on what weeds you're going after. You can just spray hot water on. Them. What can I do to pre-treat with fire to build containment lines a year ahead of time? Um, analyzing your vegetation. Uh, gosh, I believe the Fosters spoke to it earlier. They're working on some containment lines. They call them fire guards. Right now, they're going through some of that thick, nasty cedar country that Howie hadn't even had a cowboy along to check fences for 40 or 50 years. So you can start working on that a little bit at a time and, you know, just quarter mile a year, half mile a year, or a year ahead of time. Um, this is, you can pile brush and trees with equipment, which is possibly something they're doing along with just line construction. Um, sometimes if you get a heavy fuel loading in grass type, you know Kay was saying something, she didn't want the tall grass right up around her house, where you can maybe do a little high intensity grazing with electric fence, put electric fence up, run goats, cows, sheep, whatever, you don't have guard dogs or a herder. Or if you're out away from the headquarters, um, on a line where you know you want, to cut, you want to cut it off or a canyon breaks off, you know, possibly you, you can use uh, livestock grazing to help create a fire line. Uh, bring somebody in that wants to cut it and you can sell firewood posts or, or wood products. Uh, salt locations work pretty good. I like to move salt locations around. I used to make wagers with ranchers that they couldn't hide salt from a cow and I won every bet they could never hide salt from a cow. Contrary to what they thought salt needed to be on water, it doesn't. And uh, you can use these salt placement locations to concentrate cattle, sheep, I suppose sheep too. I don't have as much experience with sheep. I did have quite a bit of experience with uh, goats and goat grazing around urban interface to reduce the fuel loading around houses and so forth. But that's another good tool to use livestock. Uh, supplemental feeding too. It doesn't matter if you're feeding hay or cake. Uh, you can move the, the livestock around as well as wildlife. Topography was another area that I wanted to... That picture was taken uh, two years ago uh, in North Idaho also. That was toward getting later, later in the afternoon. Things kind of cooled off and the sun caught that bucket drop. It's kind of a unique picture. Um, Topography is pretty important. Uh, fire burns uphill faster than it does on the level. And that's pretty much all you need to remember. Uh, it burns downhill slower. And if you've got an upslope wind, it's going to go real fast. So uh, when you're analyzing topography, make sure you're aware of the slope as well as the aspect. Which direction is that slope facing? Is it going to catch the early morning sun and warm up quicker? or is it going to be a west-facing slope where it's going to catch that hot afternoon and the temperature, ambient air temperature is going to be extreme and higher than they, they normally would be. Uh, consider fuel moistures as well as humidity. This kind of gets into the, the, the one hour, the 10 hour, the 100 hour, the 1,000 hour fuels that one of the speakers spoke to early, earlier. Consider the fuel moistures and relative humidities. Humidities, like you know, are usually higher in the morning 
they drop in the afternoon. And then once that sun starts getting low or drops down, the humidities come up and the fuel moistures will go up with it. Uh, winds, uh, you know the winds in your area. Uh, they are the, the prevailing winds, probably usually southwest here. I know I was looking at the fire weather forecast for tomorrow and they're starting out to be in the southwest. And then by noon, they're gonna be out of the east-southeast. So that'll be something for those of you that are there tomorrow, just kind of keep that in your head. That's what they're predicting now. Let's see what they actually do tomorrow morning. Um, but the winds are, are driven by topography. In the mornings, you're gonna have downslope winds. In the afternoons, you're gonna have upslope winds. Your winds are gonna be affected by approaching fronts, weather systems coming in. Uh, cold fronts usually bring accelerated winds and problems if you're in the middle of a, a fire situation. And then there are also winds that are influenced by fires. Fires preheat not only the fuels ahead of them, but the air. And if you get a large, large fire, the winds will often become driven by the fire. And, and the prevailing or the direction of the wind will not be what the winds aloft or the transport winds are. They will be driven by the fire, which is sometimes really contrary or, or opposite of what you would be expecting. Um, temperatures uh, depend on the topography, your aspect, your slope. Um, this is where you possibly consider if you're in a prescribed burn, um, morning or afternoon, you know, mornings are good for line construction. You might even want to consider night line construction. Uh, you know, I, we used to run night shifts in wildfire suppression, and there's nothing to say that you can't go out if you're familiar with the country, you got good lights, do a little bit of that pre-line or pre-work, you know, during the night, or some burnout, some night burnout operations if you've got sufficient fire guards put in. And then also be aware of seasonal weather. Sometimes the winds, uh, depending on the, on the season, whether you're spring, winter, or spring, summer, fall, or winter will you know, affect your weather conditions and your winds in conjunction with topography. Grazing strategy. Um, this fire was a year ago, I think this might have been taken out west of here, uh, uh, not too far west of Angelo. Then Yearland, I think they were Yearland heifers, they were in on the prayer, eating the pear pad while it was still smoking. Uh, some of it was curiosity and most of it was because it tasted good to them. Um, you got to have a grazing strategy and whatever your system is, your passive livestock, rest after fire. You know, that's, I've heard that earlier today and all I can do is reiterate it and try to somehow in your mind build in some rest after you burn it. And usually it's going to be uh, one or two grazing systems depending on what you're trying to manage for. Are your grazing rotations flexible? Can you skip a pasture or skip two units? And can you vary the season of use? If you burn one, how flexible can you get? Um, and do you actually have stock water available? Is it seasonal? Is it a creek? Or is it a pipeline? Is it a spring windmill? And do you have rest pastures? Um, Class of livestock, uh, you can run combinations of stock, um, sheep and cows together. Uh, if you're primarily a uh, you know, cow-calf operation, you know, you've got bull pasture, replacement heifer pasture, yearlings, goat, sheep, and wildlife. Uh, the class of livestock and the season of use, or the season that they're in there is gonna affect what they're eating, you know, whether it's a browse component or the grass component. Seeding, I don't, I've worked in quite a few arid environments. Um, you tend not to want a monotypic type grass stand. You want a variety of grasses if that's possible. You need to determine what your browse and brush component is in your pasture if the diet of the class of livestock you're grazing is primarily browse or, or grass. Um, Seeding, I don't know if that's going to work. If you do need to seed following a fire or you need to determine if you want to go seeding, uh, drill it or, or broadcast it. Um, aerial seeding, uh, done a lot of it. I'm throwing some of these ideas out. 
Are some of your grasses in your pastures, are they warm season or cool season? Do they, do they green up in the spring or do they green up in the summer? And will seedings work in arid environments on your ranch? I've had a lot of failures in seedings. You know, I sure throw a lot of seed down and it don't, doesn't always work. Beg your pardon? You don't get something a lot of times. That's right. We're, we're, this is dry country down here. And uh, you got to work with Mother Nature or you got to do what she tells you to do. Rehab, recovery, and rest. rest. That question kind of went along with that. Uh, there's, there's two terms in the fire world, and uh, there's fire intensity and fire duration. Um, fire intensity is basically how hot the fire was. Fire duration is how long it stayed in that one particular spot. The longer a fire stays in that one particular spot, the more, <coughs> excuse me, the more it's going to heat up that particular spot and you'll get increased soil temperatures which may damage grass plants or you know affect the, the character of the soil and make it somewhat, well in some cases, impervious to water. Um, Morgan, I know Dr. Morgan Russell, she had did a lot of work on soil temperatures and you can approach her later. At, uh, she had soil probes in the soil and would detect changes in soil temperature as the fire progressed over that site. And it's, it's pretty interesting. I know earlier today we heard, we all, all know that black absorbs heat. And uh, I've always thought that that's why you get tremendous high intensity, short duration thunderstorms over a burn. It seems like invariably in the mountainous terrain. And it's because that black soil heats up so much and you get that convection, that warm air rising and that builds a thunderstorm and creates those really heavy, high intensity, short duration thunderstorms right over your dang burn, right on the black, and you get some soil loss and, you know, some erosion uh, channel started, uh, along sometimes with mass movement. Fire, I, and I, I think this gentleman, he's, and this is my opinion, this is not backed by research or any time I had to do any research. The fire does not seem to destroy seed and bud sources of good grasses or weeds or invasive weeds. Once the, the seed source is in the ground, most of the fires tend to move rather quickly enough that they don't really affect the germination rate of uh, most of that, that seed bank of whatever seed it is in the ground. Um, rehab, recovery, and west, rest, it, was it a patch burn or a mosaic? I think we've heard that word today too. Most fires don't go through with 100% consumption over large areas. A lot of times they're a mosaic, a patch burn, it gets affected by a repairing area, a wind shift, a canyon, or a road, or anything that'll affect that, uh, that fire progression or that, that head of the fire movement. So, Patch burns are good. You really don't want a continuous burn in some areas, depending on what your objectives are and how large of an area you're burning. Uh, you probably you can consider some watershed values, uh, soil loss, water quality, repairing values. If you burn an entire watershed out, and by that I mean, say, a, a particular one canyon or one draw, say it's got live water in it, a stream, and if you just actually nuke it and take everything out, you can probably expect a little bit of increased sediment, soil movement into that, that stream system. If it's a small side canyon where it hits a burn, an unburned area down below it, that may filter some of the sediment out, so you'll just have some relatively short-term minor effects. But if it's a larger watershed, you need to be concerned with your long-term damage to that particular watershed and, and repairing values. Uh, repairing values, most of the repairing areas that I've seen burnt, wildfire or prescribed, they respond really quickly. They've got enough moisture, water availability that you can go through and heat them up pretty hot and most of them seem to be sprouting species and they respond rather rapidly and successfully to, to fire. This is the adaptive part, I guess, of Lemons and lemonade. Learn and, uh, we're kind of starting to wrap it up here too. Learn and educate yourself in your own way. You've heard a lot of stuff today and just learn what you can and educate yourself and remember stuff and educate yourself in your way what's needed on your place.
have prepared objectives in your head or wrote down. Um, if you're going home tonight or you know some other time this summer or even next winter, get a lot of these thoughts in your mind, write them down or just keep them in the, in the back of your head on what you think you could do or might not do. And then if you get a chance to talk to a, somebody that's a little more knowledgeable and expertise or somebody that's burned some, ask them what they think, run those questions by them, but be prepared to implement fire on your place because it's going to happen sometime, somewhere, somehow. Photographs are very important. That hasn't been mentioned much today, but establish photo points. And again, I'm, there's been some before and after pictures. Those are good to take uh, where you actually have a, a significant landmark or something that's re-identifiable. Somebody can come back 5, 10, 20, 30 years later and take that same photograph with the background of the skyline, the horizon, or a mountain, or, or something in the background to detect changes in vegetation that occur if you get fire introduced. Just maintain that photographic history of what progress you've made. You might be surprised at most unsuspecting photos that you take, and even during a branding or uh, you know, on a deer hunting trip or something, they provide to be quite valuable if the wildfire comes in later, you know, if you, if the wildfire comes in, you can compare them before and after pictures. Part of your prescribed burden planning should be to take photographs of before and after pictures. A good fire, you know, meets planned objectives. And the other fire does not meet objectives. And uh, it could be that the the other fire may have exceeded your objectives, been too hot, or it may have been too cold. You didn't have enough wind or you had too much, or it made you pucker up really tight. So there are several kinds of fire, and just keep in mind, be prepared for the good ones, and uh, almost expect something else. And it could be better than what you expected. Uh, percentage black. I think I heard Treadwell talk about that this morning you can sometimes estimate area burn by a percentage of area burn and you can you can actually do that on probably not google but a drone could fly it and you can actually look view down on the burn area and determine what's black and what's green and in a lot of cases wildfire you're quite surprised you know you hear all these figures at 40,000 acres burn when you fly it, it may actually be only about 25 or 30,000 acres burned and you've got green islands and some patchwork that remained intact that didn't get burned in a wildfire. But get some idea in your pre-planning, uh, in your prescribed burn, what do you think will burn? And there might be some islands or places that you won't be able to burn. Be very adaptive. Uh, adapt to what you have or what you get. You know, you just kind of got to be, maybe that comes with old age, but you just kind of got to play the cards that were dealt to you. So have that in your mind that you're going to accept what you get. And it may be good or bad. Uh, so for an example, uh, helicopter walking, wheeler, horseback, boat train, fire engine, and pickup. Those are all means that I've used to initial attack a wildfire, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I was thinking about that a couple of years ago, but there's been a variety of, of ways that I've got transportation into IA of fire. So just adapt to what you have or what you can get your hands on. Um, I don't know where the boat rides were. One of them was in Roosevelt, Arizona. Another was Lake Ponderay, North Idaho. Uh, I hijacked a, a, a railroad work crew that was replacing railroad ties up on the Clearwater River in Idaho three years ago, and they gave us a ride in on the work, work train and we went in about two miles. Of course, it was a railroad fire. They created it. The brakes got hot, and so they were probably more than happy to give us a ride in there. But we were taking a Mark III pump. It was a gas-operated pump. They weighed probably 35 pounds, if I remember right, five gallons of fuel, and then we had guys in, in packs and nobody wanted to pack that pump in and, and, and hose. So we throwed it on the train and we got a ride in. Um, the next part is look over your fences for fence line contrast. How many times have we went, been going somewhere and 
And uh, I'm kind of like to gawk and look and see what the neighbors are doing or if I get a new piece of country. And you can see fence line contrasts everywhere you go. It don't matter if it's Montana or West Texas. And uh, look at those fence line contrasts. Try to make guesses as to why you think they are because they are. Uh, some of the easy ones are, you know, well, this guy runs sheep and goats, this guy's got cows, this guy runs yearling, this guy grazes continuous year long, this guy's got a little bit of a rotation pasture. Um, maybe in a few years you get up to that foster country, they'll say, well, this country looks different because they're burning on this side and they aren't on the other. Uh, but fence line contrasts are a good, good way to find out what works where you live. And uh, if you're not sure what's going on, ask your neighbor. You know, just, you know, get together, build that relationship, get it together in your prescribed burn association, compare ideas. There's no use trying to do something that doesn't work. Find out what's working and, and make, make that repetitive. <coughs> treat it together as a landscape. You know, you don't want to go in and just treat an acre here, an acre there, or a place here and a plate there. If you can talk to your neighbors, get the big picture and treat it as a landscape, treat it as a county. And then finally, you know, site visits. Go to wildfire locations, go to prescribed fire locations, and go to places where there's been no fire. Get an idea in your head of what it may look like after a wildfire or after a prescribed fire. You know, actually go on the ground, walk around, and, and look at it up close. Just don't take speakers' opinions for it, like us guys up here talking. Get out and look for yourself and see what will fit for you. This is kind of just a fun thing for information. Morgan can probably get copies of it. Standard firefighting orders are called the 10 standard firefighting orders. They've been around since, gosh, the Man Gulch fire up in Idaho. I, gosh, I think they might go back that far. I can't remember. I think it's 47. Is it 47? But these are, I, I won't have to read them to you. You can read them on your own. But these are standard firefighting orders to keep you from getting in trouble, whether it's an escape or sky burn or a wildfire situation. More recently, probably 15 years ago, this is called laces. A firefighter was out, you know, usually wear leather lace up boots and he's looking down at his laces and this is lookouts, communication, escape routes and safety zones, boot laces. This is just a good checklist of something to run by your mind when you're putting together a burn plan or you're actually out on the ground. Um, just think of boot laces, uh, LCES. Lookouts is where if you're gonna have a burning situation, you have a lookout established up on a hill across canyon where he can see the entire fire. Communication means radio, cell phones. And escape routes is identify your escape routes or even a prescribed burn, if something goes wrong, make sure all the crew members know the escape route. In other words, how to walk out or drive out. And then safety zones is, are identified at the end of escape routes. Um, that's where the escape routes lead to. It's just kind of a checklist. Uh, fatalities can happen. Uh, it wasn't Texas, it was Oklahoma. Four fatalities this year uh, in 2017. I believe it was Oklahoma, wasn't it? And uh, it does happen, and you don't know when it's going to happen, but it's just kind of a mental checklist. Just remember bootlaces. Uh, these are 18 situations that shout watch out. These are actually situations where there's, there's uh, been a tragedy, a fatality, uh, a fire not scouted up and sized up. It was, I think, 12 situations. They added six on to it about 10, 15 years ago. But these are all situations as far as safety goes when one of the 10 standard fire fighting orders wasn't adhered to. Uh, in country not seen in the daylight, you get to a fire, it's night, you go on the line, and uh, man, it all looks different at night, and then it looks really different the next day. Safety zones, escape routes not identified, unfamiliar with weather, uh, uninformed on strategy, tactics, and hazards, that's poor communication. Instructions and assignments not clear, you know, meeting by the windmill, well, he didn't know which windmill. No communication again. Constructing line without an anchor point. You need an anchor point and a beginning point to begin your burn. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, you don't usually frontal assault the fire, unburnt fuel between you and the fire. Uh, weather, wind, terrain, and feel like taking a nap on the fire line.
that's it, fellas. Uh, appreciate your attention, and I hope I added something. I'm glad you're here to learn something. Uh, that's the whole point.